Welcome to the Game Deflators podcast, season two, episode one. My name is John, and I am joined by our new co-host, Ryan. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. My name is Ryan. i am uh, known John for a few years now. He asked me to step in and be the new co-host, so I'm happy to be here and talk games with you, John. Yeah, happy to have you, man. So uh, on the Game of Flavors podcast, if you're not familiar with it, we discuss the gaming market. We discuss games that we're currently playing, games we've picked up, and we uh, evaluate games. So that's going to be part of our new inflation deflation segment where we pull a title off of my shelf or a downloadable title or just really any game that we can find and get our hands on. And we evaluate the current value that it is going for, and we discuss whether or not that game has truly been inflated or should be deflated. So the first game that we have on the docket this week is Voice, released on mobile platforms and then re-released on Switch. And we'll be getting to that at the end of the podcast. But for now, sticking with the formula, we're going to start opening up with our recent pickups this week. John, I know you got some exciting stuff. What'd you get? Yeah, so this week, man, I picked up a couple new titles. I picked up Clayton Returns on the PS4. It's a 16-bit action RPG uh, that was released a good while back. You can pick it up at GameStop for about 9 bucks if you have their uh, player rewards um, you know, program that you're on, or anybody can be on. So uh, that's that one. I haven't played it yet. Uh, it does look interesting. Don't want to judge a book by its cover, but kind of excited to play this one just based on what it looks like. Uh, The other game I picked up, though, was Little Nightmares on the PS4. Now, this is a game that I had my eye on for quite a while, and I was able to get it for under 20 bucks, brand new, um, with the DLC and everything included. So, played it over the weekend, actually went ahead and beat it. It's about four to five hours of gameplay outside of the DLC, which is what I'm currently on. And uh, my first impressions of it are, I would consider a 9 out of 10, as far as uh, if you're looking for four to five hours of super quick gameplay... It's a side-scrolling, horror, puzzle-type game. Kind of similar, if you're familiar, to like Inside and Limbo, where you've got certain actions you need to take and, um, you know, get to the end of a level. It's kind of a similar process in that sense. So you're stuck in essentially this, like, house or initially, like, this drainage pipe. And you play this little character, kind of looks like a gnome, uh, with a yellow raincoat. And you're traveling through these various levels. And as you progress, um, it turns out it's like this world of disgusting, vile humans that are trying to essentially eat the little kids that are in the home and sewer and everything else. It's it's actually pretty freaky in a sense when you've got a chef in the corner just like chopping up bits of fish and meat and stuff with a cleaver and just hammering at it and um, spying you by sniffing you out and all, all this crazy stuff involved in it. So... I would say that within my time playing this game, um, there was a few moments I jumped, mainly because it was just a moment I was not expecting, um, as far as you know something just kind of coming out of nowhere and finding you and grabbing you with their hands. Like that was those jump type factors. But once you get hit that first time, it's it's a non-issue after that, as far as the fear part is concerned. Um, again, though. Four to five hours of gameplay, super quick. If you can get this title for like 10 bucks, uh, I guarantee you're going to enjoy it and it's totally worth the gameplay at that point. Kind of sounds like a dark Smurfs, like a little running around Gargamel trying to chase after you, pick you up and eat you. Yeah, I mean, that'd probably be a a pretty accurate comparison. Um, Honestly, man, it was, it kind of reminded me of It in a sense. Um, You know, what's the little kid's name in It? Oh uh, gosh! Um, Apparently, we don't watch very many movies. Right, I saw it at theaters. I haven't seen it again yet. It was good. Yeah, yeah, it was just, a good movie. I'm terrible with names. Yeah, same here. So yeah, it reminded me of a little kid with a yellow raincoat, and he's walking around, and obviously the clown gets him and whatnot. And it kind of a similar vibe I got. You're just little kid in this giant world with these humans, and you're in a little raincoat, and you're trying to traverse through these pipes and various levels and climbing on closet doors and drawers and everything else you can think of yeah i've seen some coverage of it it definitely looked like an interesting game so i'll uh i'll definitely be interested in maybe picking that up once you're done with it yeah no i'll hand it to you when i'm done so uh this week i picked up uh one strike i actually picked it up last week but hadn't really checked it out much yet i picked it up for a dollar on the switch marketplace it's a two-player fighting game where the gimmick is you've got one hit to connect to kill your opponent 
it's set in like a kind of like samurai period you've got a couple people with swords somebody with a chain size somebody with like a long pole arm weapon there's you know six different characters they all play radically different as far as uh their movement type and how their attacks range out on one another and it's all about trying to bait out your opponent's moves and get them to move into a place where you can connect without them being able to have time to block or if they do block not being able to retaliate so it moves really quick you've got five lives i think it was per round so you get hit round over hit round over whoever wins ends up uh, being the person with the either better reaction time or the stronger bait and switch tactics and for a dollar it, it was really killer pickup i think it's regularly five dollars i don't know if it's still on sale because the switch doesn't show you the price of anything on the market after you've already purchased it unfortunately but it's uh it's a good time. It's a definitely a good time that you can use. I don't know how much replayability it has. It's definitely not a fair game to bring to somebody else that hasn't played it if uh, they're expecting any kind of chance because once you kind of get the hang of it, you're going to dominate whoever you're playing with if they have no experience with it. Yeah, man, I know we were discussing it earlier. Uh, a game like that at a dollar just seems like you know, 100% worth of value no matter how you look at it. It could be the crappiest game in the world, and I still think that it's going to hold some sort of value in that dollar sense. Uh, just because when you start comparing it to other forms of entertainment, it only makes sense. You know, I just went to a movie last week for my fiancé, and I was 20 bucks to go see a movie, uh, minus any popcorn or anything else we got. You straight out just threw a dollar at a random title, and if you enjoyed that game for just two hours or even played it within that period of time, totally worth the money at that point. Well, I know a couple weeks ago we were um, doing some practice recordings for this, and I picked up cr two crude dudes for the Switch for a, uh, a shot at our inflation deflation, and I picked it up for $9. I think I played it total for less than two hours, and I would say that even that was worth the $9 I spent on it. It's not the greatest game, but I mean, just to see kind of what went into the game and how it compared to the uh, Genesis version we were playing. Uh, I think that buying these cheap deals on Switch, I mean, it's really just what everybody's been doing on Steam for years, but now in a portable way brought to you by Nintendo. Yeah, man, totally gotcha. Um, so are there any other games that you're playing currently? Um, so... I'm still working my three through the messenger. I got a good couple hours in yesterday. I'm in the final stages of the end game. I'll definitely have it done next week and be able to talk about that a little bit more. If you haven't played the messenger, pick it up. It is a an amazing time. It's a side scrolling Ninja Gaiden inspired uh, adventure. It's got some light RPG elements with the uh, upgrade tree and uh, various items and story bits that you can pick up throughout. The writing is hilarious. The combat and movement is very precise. And you really feel those gains of putting in the play hours to be able to control your character and just kind of speed run through these areas. The game really opens up in the second half in ways that you would be very surprised by the start of the game and how it carries through to the end. Uh, it's it, it's really good. Uh, I've been having a ton of fun with that, and I'll get to more of that next week after I beat it. But then we're also playing uh, Prey. Me and my wife, we've been playing that for a few weeks now, and that's a real good time too. Uh, it's been a while since I've really played one of those Bioshock kind of uh, adventure first person shooters with that kind of atmosphere that really grips you and really pulls you into the world. Uh, every weekend we're excited to get in and get some more game time on that. So we're definitely going to be picking up more of that tonight and trying to you know keep going through there. So that's that's what I've been playing. What have you been playing? Yeah, so really the only thing I've been playing since I finally beat Horizon Zero Dawn and the DLC 
was uh, Little Nightmares this week. I just, it got to a point I was playing about, I think I put in 70 hours or so into Horizon Zero Dawn. Fantastic game. If you have not played that title yet, definitely pick up the complete Game of the Year edition. It's like 20 bucks right now, brand new. So definitely worth the value. I would highly recommend it. But the other title I've been playing is uh, Little Nightmares. I mean, I've just tried to kill a little bit of time, uh, pun intended. And, um, you know, I looked it up. There's a website I typically go on. It's called uh, howlongtobeat.com. So after I've played a game that's 60, 70 hours in length, I'll typically check out that website, look on my shelf, find about five, six games that are of interest to me, and then I'll say, all right, how long is it going to take to beat this on average? And it's not to say, you know, I don't want to get into a game that's, you know, 40, 50 hours and I'm not interested in playing something of that nature. It's just I need kind of that break from the monotonous, continually playing the same title for so long. And if I just got into a crazy grind of 60, 70 hours, I want to jump into just something super quick that I can enjoy and then move forward onto my next big title. So um, I guess a little bit of a preview for the next game I'm going to be playing is going to be Hoshigami Running Blue Earth on PS1. I was initially playing this before Horizon Zero Dawn, but I got a little tired of the very much grind fest type of style of the game. Their leveling up is super slow, the character development is super slow, but it's a title that has great reviews, and uh, it's one I've always wanted to, to complete since I was probably 12 years old. So that's what I'm going to be playing next. Um, as far as gaming in general in the industry so to kind of get out of what we're currently playing what we're doing let's kind of talk about what's in the current market and the big news this week was nintendo online so nintendo released their online service uh, highly anticipated and uh, everybody's looking forward to this now we're gonna really quickly discuss kind of uh i guess in a sense our opinions on the Nintendo Online, I'm very much in the negative. Ryan's been very much in the positive as to what's going We've on. We've talked about this extensively, and we feel that it's best for everybody out there and for our friendship and our uh, podcasting relationship to not get as deep into it as we have before and just kind of give you an abridged version of our takes on the situation. I'll just have you know, starting out, that Ryan was wrong. So, uh... The actual service itself, and I'm going to kind of be blatant out here right away, um, 20 bucks a year I think is totally worth it if you're looking for an online service and the ability to play with friends. So I will put that out right away. Now, as far as... One point for me. Sure, we'll go with the one point for you. It, you're going to lose anyways. So the overall idea of Nintendo Online, the thing that's kind of peeved me are a few little things. So you have the issue, which a lot of people have voiced their complaints on, in that if you have any lapse in time uh, with payment, and that could be uh, if you were going month-to-month, -month, for example, which I'm not sure yet if there is a month-to-month -month option, but if there is a month-to-month -month option, say you lapse in payment, any of your online data that has been saved on the Nintendo cloud storage is automatically deleted. Now, I have heard folks say, well, you know, if you've paid for the service and you're no longer using the service... Uh, you shouldn't have the right to just have your Nintendo store or Nintendo store your data. Um, I will point to Sony and their sixty dollars a year and the ability that if I decide one day that I am not going to pay for the service and just hold off for a couple months, I can come back and pick right where I left off. I can have all my save data. I can have all my titles that have been downloaded, which I may not have had access to when I lapsed in payment, but I have the ability to go back and forth in using the service, which with Nintendo, I think we're going to see some backlash from fans, and I think overall uh, you will have fans kind of dictate what happens with their online service. And I think we'll see. Nintendo has a history of not listening, but we will we will see what occurs with that. Um, the other couple issues I've seen, and uh, Ryan will definitely hammer me on this one a bit, is you have access to a library of NES games. Now, it's not a lot of games. It's probably about 20 to 30 games. And when you pay for the service, you have the ability to play these games. Now, the issue that a lot of people have raised as a concern is if you do not check in on a weekly basis with Nintendo, you lose your ability to play those NES titles. And that is, in my mind, a major issue, considering that if I am paying for the service on an annual basis... 
why should I not be able to not check in for a week? If I am out on business, if I am out of the country, if I don't have access to my switch at any point, say I go on a road trip and I don't have an access to connect to the internet at any time, if I don't check in within that one week time frame, Nintendo basically just says, here's a middle finger and um, yeah, move forward and you're not gonna be able to play our games. So that's an issue that I've, I haven't taken too lightly. I do understand, you know, hey, you're using the online service. Why are you paying for an online service if you're not going to use it? But stuff happens and not everybody's online all the time. So that was that little bit of a, an issue I've had. And um, overall, I would say for the 20 bucks, you know, Ryan, it definitely is a decent service for 20 bucks. I know I will be getting it just to kind of put in your face that it is not from a value concept that I am uh, angry about Nintendo. So you can see that it's, you know, it's it's not the $20. It's, it's the, um, I guess, the, uh, the moral aspect of Nintendo and how they've treated their fans over the years. So that's my take on it. Um, we'll see what Nintendo does. We're going to see how to market. You know, they're very new as far as, you know, Nintendo hasn't really done something like this before. They had online for the Wii U. Um, I felt it was okay. Uh, but for the Switch, this is a totally new concept for them. It's a way to pump in some cash into their, uh, you know, into their reservoir, and we will see how they treat it. All right. So, me and John have very different opinions on this, but there are some common grounds that we can agree on. And I've done some thinking since the last time we talked about it, and I've got some new opinions too. So the first opinion that I have is definitely in agreement with John. Twenty dollars a year is super reasonable. It's about a third of the price of what you're going to pay for Sony or Xbox. And you probably only get about the third of the value of that. One point for John. Okay. So we're even again. So for those of you keeping score. So the uh, you only get about a third of the content. I mean, I'd definitely rather get, you know, a full-on PS3 game versus an NES legacy title. That, you know, who knows if you already own five copies of that on various Nintendo platforms over the ages. But that's kind of the biggest contention point. And I've argued this with several different people. And I I think it's just me. I think maybe I'm the only person on earth that thinks this way. Because nobody else seems to agree that if you are buying an online service and not connecting to the internet on it. And then complaining about not getting the free tertiary content that comes with doing that. Like, you're like saying, I'm not using it for its intended purpose. And now I'm mad that I don't get the additional benefits of it. Which, if those additional benefits weren't there, you would never complain about not being able to play online when you're not connected to the internet. Like, it's an additional benefit. It's not its own thing. If you were specifically paying for the NES games, I would totally agree that you should be able to have access to them because you bought them, but you didn't. You're borrowing them from a service. That it, you're paying for. That you're paying for. It's like saying, oh, man, I really wish that I could uh, you know, watch my cable TV while I'm in my car. Like, If you're not at home, you don't have access to your cable TV, you're not generally complaining about the lack of ability to watch it wherever you are. And that's just, that's just kind of my take on that. Well, I'll have you know, I can access DirecTV on my cell phone at any point. Yeah, but only where you have internet connection, John. Only where you have internet connection. Phone service. Yeah, so you could Wi-Fi hotspot your uh, Switch. Very true. And, I mean, what's the time limit? Like, how long do you actually have to be connected to get that one week check in. Well, because I know every time I come home and I turn my switch on, it latches onto my Wi Fi, and that pretty much does it for me. And if I haven't played my switch in a week, I'm not worried about not being able to play games that are like 30, 40 years old. Well, I think the actual like connection times required is about the five minutes spent in you have to check in with Reggie while you do it as well. So I just want to point that out. Oh, so you got to get in the queue to get lined up and talk to Reggie. Yeah, exactly. If you don't talk to Reggie, you just you don't have no access whatsoever, and the whole NES thing is just out the window, man. No Reggie, no online connection. Nintendo just says, "Here's your twenty dollars back." So the other opinion that I've kind of turned around as far as the online service 
is that the connection through your phone for the uh, communications. You know, if you're going to be talking to people, you have to go through the phone app in order to do that. Now, I was doing some research yesterday because one of my biggest gripes with the Switch is the lack of Bluetooth compatibility for headphones and how that goes because I've got some Beats X. I use them for everything except my Switch. I can't use them on my Switch. And now there is a third party out there developing a Bluetooth dongle that plugs into the bottom of your Switch to give you that ability to have the Bluetooth headphones work with it. Now, my question is, if I have to use a headset to go through my phone while I'm trying to play online, how does that interact with the game audio itself? If I'm uh, somewhere out and about and I have to take my phone out, turn it into a hotspot, connect my switch to the hotspot in order to play online, connect my headset to my phone in order to communicate with people I'm playing online with, and then I have to blast the music loud enough that I can hear it over the people in my ears, and now I'm driving everybody crazy around me. Yeah, so this kind of reminds me of uh, Sega. You remember having a, you know, you had your Sega Genesis connected to your Sega CD, which then had your Sega 32X on top of that, and then you had your power base converter and whatever other items. I think Nintendo, you know what? What Sega does, Nintendo don't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is really Nintendo's big first step into online. It's a tricky first step, too, because there's the whole half-portable system, half-home console system, and they're still trying to you know make that work as well as possible. So I think it'll be a good first try for sure, and I'm not even worried about like the, the online saving content. Like I know Nintendo doesn't really change its opinion often after it's made up its mind about something but you know with the service being less than a month old who's to say that they don't have time to change their minds on these things or adapt it to be able to work for more of a consumer friendly intent moving forward from here they've got you know they've got my twenty dollars for the first year and we'll see how much i actually use it and you know then this time next year, we'll probably do an inflation deflation on that. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Well, uh, if you were keeping score at home, um, I think that was like 10 for me and 2 for Ryan. So, yeah, I think that's a fair fair assessment, right? You know, I'm, I'm just tired of arguing with everybody about it and uh, knowing in my heart of hearts that uh, nobody understands me. Speaking of heart of hearts, uh, TGS and... The Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer. Did you get to check that out? Yeah, I sure did. Tokyo Game Show 2018 coming at you with a bunch of new trailers for all your favorite upcoming games. We had Kingdom Hearts. We had Devil May Cry. We had uh, what else is written on the list? Tetris Effect. Shadows Die Twice. Tsushima. We had it all, and it was all glorious. Yeah, man. So I would say out of Tokyo Game Show, there's a lot of cool titles. Um, that were announced. I think, uh, was it Judge Eyes, I think, was a new IP that Sega uh, brought up. Uh, that one kind of looks like, I mean, it's by the Yakuza team, so it pretty much looks like Yakuza again. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So it's like more of a serious take. I've never played any of the Yakuza games, but um, I, I get the idea of kind of where they're coming from. They're kind of like a, an Eastern take on like a Grand Theft Auto kind of format, right? Yeah, it's essentially what it is. Yeah, I mean, it is Yakuza. It's pretty much gangs and such, and it's more action-y, I guess, in a sense, than uh, Grand Theft Auto is, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Grand Theft Auto is a little more gimmicky, and uh, that's really one of the main reasons that I prefer a game like Yakuza. Uh, with Grand Theft Auto, I've always found myself uh, trying to get five stars and running around the city with a tank versus actually playing the game. So... Uh, other games that kind of caught my eye, uh, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Uh, it's a game that's uh, being pushed out by Activision. It's from software that's actually developing it. Uh, it's pretty much everything that Nero wanted to be. Or Neo, sorry, not Nero. Uh, Neo on the uh, PS4, um, which was essentially Samurai Dark Souls uh, with an American guy that was playing the samurai. So it was pretty interesting. 
Um, overall, I've talked about Nero, or not Nero, geez, Neo in previous episodes of the Game Deflators with James. Uh, it was a terrible game, terrible take on what would have been a very good Dark Souls type title. I think uh, Sekiro is going to kind of take that mantle as the next Bloodborne Dark Souls type of game. I've already pre ordered my special edition of that. I'm super excited. If you haven't seen the trailer yet, that was at TGS. Go ahead and check it out. It's extremely brutal and uh, lots of blood, lots of uh, action y scenes, fire, ninjas everywhere. It, it looks pretty sick. Did you get to check out any of, I think it's called Deeracine for PSVR? It looks like it's also a From Software game. It's a like PSVR uh, adventure game taking place in a school. Did you see any of that? I saw the initial trailer when they first announced it, which was at E3. I didn't. Once I heard it was for PSVR, I don't have a PSVR, and I have no intentions of getting one just yet. Um, except Ace Combat Seven may change my opinion on that. Uh, but I haven't looked too much into it. I want to see some more trailers, and um, you know, I really, as far as PSVR is concerned, it's something I'm interested in getting at some point, but. I have no intention right now, and this is a title that, because it's limited to just PSVR, I'm probably just going to skip it for a bit. Yeah, I've actually recently really started to get my hopes up for PSVR. I'm not sure if I'm going to get it soon, but that's just because I've seen that they are having a, you know, a second gen coming down the pipe, but we've also got PS5 coming down the pipe too, so... I don't know if PSVR 2 is going to launch with PS5. It would make sense to me to do that. But then again, updating the PS4, the original PSVR, uh, I mean, it's still using, you know, the PlayStation Move light ball wands. So that could use an update. I actually I saw a really good video few weeks ago on youtube by super bunny hop check his content out he's great his uh his video made vr look really attractive and um the surprise thing for me from tokyo game show 2018 was uh tetris effect it looks like a really crazy way to just kind of sit back and play arguably the best puzzle game of all time but with like crazy you know 3d environments and all kinds of like lights going off and so it was it was really an interesting trailer and it made tetris look you know a lot more like something that i want to experience rather than just something that i've done a million times yeah i would say the other title that really got my eye and mainly because i enjoyed playing it on the ps2 was devil may cry 5 now, not saying Devil May Cry 5 was on the PS2, so anybody tries to misquote me there. But uh, Devil May Cry 5, uh, they just had a trailer for it. Looks like uh, the old Devil May Cry 1 through 3 style gameplay. Um, same type of demeanor from Dante. It, in my mind, uh, is going to be a lot better than that garbage that was released. I think it was on PS4 very early on. DMC? Yeah, DMC. Their attempted reboot, which obviously... Uh, didn't go too well because we don't have another game after that. Right. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, Devil May Cry. I only played a little bit of three, but, um, you know, Dante's a super cool character. And I, I've got a lot of, surprisingly enough, nostalgia for reading about the games. Like back in Game Informer in the day and uh, watching friends play rather than actually playing it myself. And it's... Uh, it's definitely something that I've been wanting to check out for a long time. So hopefully this will be a good place to jump into the series and kind of uh, start that start that uh, Devil May Cry off fresh for me. Fresh for me. Okay, sweet. Uh, <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. All right, so uh, TGS, obviously uh, there's probably going to be a lot more that comes right after the show is done. Uh, I still need to watch a lot more trailers and get some more info. Um, by the way, Devil May Cry 5, just want to really touch base on that because I was really looking forward to it based on a trailer, but then you brought up to me that there's a pay-to-win uh, type of microtransaction that's going to happen in that game. That immediately is making me uh, not want to support them. Uh, so I know we've discussed that in the past. Um, 
but you know, like seriously, a pay to win style. Can we not have a game where you don't have to pay for microtransactions that can assist you in actually defeating the game? Like, have we gotten that low that we need to use our credit card to beat a game? Well, I mean, it's like you bought the game. Like, why do you need to, in a single player game, spend money to increase your character? Like, don't you pl- buy the game to play the game? Rather than buy the game to buy the end of the game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is really just a wrong title to be doing this now, unless they have like some sort of versus mode or something online that we're not aware of right now, um, and we haven't researched. I really don't see any reason. uh, Even then, I don't support it. But microtransactions for a single player game is just absolutely ridiculous. Like, if you're changing your character, Dante's like his coat color or his trench coat, whatever he's got on. What the hell are you going to do? Like, invite your buddy over and say, hey, man, I just spent two bucks and got the blue version of Dante's trench coat. You got to check this out. It looks awesome. Well, and especially with uh, Spider-Man having just coming out. And Spider-Man's got, like, 40 different costumes, I think. And all those different costumes have different powers. And you can even mix and match the powers without even having to change the costume. So it's like that game really gives you that kind of feel for what microtransactions look like when they're not microtransactions. They're just included in the game because the developers had enough love and care to give the fans what they would really want. Yeah, exactly. Uh, This seriously, I I hope it honestly burns them in a sense. Uh, In my mind, this is just pure greed at that point. Yeah. So another uh, thing about Tokyo Game Show that I saw, kind of going back to what we were talking about with Switch Online, is a new game called Ninjala. I think that. Yeah, Ninjala. It's a. Uh, it it looks very Splatoon esque in the art style, cutesy. Um, you know, children type characters running around a city. They're all kind of like punked out a little bit in their uh, aesthetic style. Uh, they're all blowing big bubblegum bubbles, and they've got big stylized bats running around doing ninja jumps around the city it looks like it's going to be a fun online multiplayer whereas instead of using uh guns and paint to capture an arena and shoot your opponents it looks like it's going to be more of a frantic melee style 3d action brawler with some uh Mario Kart Battle Arena bubble type health system or something. I don't know. It's it's not a long trailer, but it definitely looks like something that makes me say, hey, you know, this looks like an interesting game, but this is definitely a game that none of my friends are going to buy. And if I want to play it, I'm going to have to get that online service to play. So, you know, we'll see what comes of that game. And, you know, uh, I know that people have been playing ARMS online for a long time. I know people have been playing Splatoon online for a long time. And now they're having to pay for those services. So let's see what it looks like when Nintendo builds a game with the intent of having to pay for it, you know, from the get-go. And see how that influences how they build the online services. By the way, your description of Ninjala just now made me think that Nintendo got in a nice board of all their executives and said, what can we do to make people think that we're original? And they said, well, let's take Mario Kart, let's take Splatoon, and let's take Mario, and let's just make one video game and just kind of call it Ninjala. I mean, it definitely has aspects of all of those things, but I mean, you know, Nintendo's also been putting out zelda's every couple of years and they're always the killer app on the platform so you know originality only goes so far when you've got a company driven by nostalgia and perfect gameplay yeah really i mean you kind of hit the uh the nail on the head there nostalgia is really what in recent years has truly been driving nintendo now um going into nostalgia in a sense so one thing that we posted a while back on our Game Deflators Facebook page was physical or digital, which reigns supreme in the world of video games. So sitting here in my game room and looking at nearly 2,000 video games. It's a com- very impressive collection. It's right behind me and it constantly distracts me during the podcast. Yeah, so seeing this collection I have to stare at the entire time we're recording. Um, obviously, I am on the side of physical reign supreme. I like the ability to pull something off my shelf at any point, not be stuck to one particular console, 
Um, I like the ability to be able to trade in if I want, sell off a title if I have an extra sitting around. You know, the flexibility of a physical game in that sense to me makes it so much worth it. While I can see the convenience associated with a digital copy, I like the physical feel. I like having a manual in my hand, being able to flip through a book. There's a, a nostalgic feeling behind that, having started playing games back in the late NES era, early Super Nintendo time period. Ryan, I think you are a little more on a digital side, right? You know, and it's not like it's something that I've been doing for a long time. It's really just been in the last couple of years since I've been getting all the great downloads through PS Plus and picking up uh, digital titles for my Vita. I've always been a physical game type person. I love collector's editions. I like having, you know, like you said, the box and stuff. But I feel like physical has gone down a lot. Like the coolest thing that you get with a physical game these days, if it's just the standard edition, is maybe a reversible cover. Because like a lot of the games, they still have spots in the cases to hold manuals, but they don't have manuals. And if they do, they're just the basic disclaimers. They're not what they used to be. So I feel like the quality's gone down a bit. And the older I get, the more I just... I don't care about having more stuff crowding my life. I'd rather be able to have something on demand when I want it than have to worry about trying to... Okay, now i got to go upstairs. Now i got to get this. i got to make sure the game doesn't get scratched. You know, I don't really... I kind of stopped trading games in because I traded enough games in back in the day to ruin any chance of ever having any kind of meaningful collection of anything. But, you know, I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't buy physical because there's still the appeal of getting a great deal on something. And you're rarely going to get those great deals on digital. But I do respect that, like, Switch has... Uh, those sales, like I got Run Strike for a dollar as opposed to five dollars because I acted on it. Uh, Okami, when it came out, I think it was 20% off when it came out. And then there's also uh, like the switch points. You get points in your digital marketplace, uh, kind of pennies on the dollar for everything you buy. But I mean, those add up after a while and you can definitely use that as a reward system for yourself. So both sides have their merits, but Moving forward, for me, it just it just makes more sense to go digital. And especially because nowadays on, like, the PS4, you still have to install that game onto the console. So it's like, if it's going to eat up all your memory anyways, and then you still need to put the disc in to play it, like, you might as well skip the disc and just install it fully digital yeah i mean I, I get your point on that and i actually have god since i've had playstation plus probably about 50 or 60 digital copies of games sitting on my uh, ps4 right now so i do understand the convenience and the ability to just say hey look i want to play the telltale batman game that you know just came out which unfortunately will probably never get a sequel um now that you know telltale's broken up essentially but you know at the same time you know you brought up a, a pretty good point in that you know, you don't have that flexibility on savings either. So what's essentially a $30 game as a digital copy, I can typically pick that up at a, you know, a secondhand shop, whether it's GameStop or somewhere local, for 50% of a price sometimes. And even if I'm getting off of a, a third-party application like a Craigslist and buying locally from somebody off there, I mean, you're looking at, you know, sometimes $10 for a game that digitally is selling for 30 Now, I do know that like PS Plus has like 50% off sales and stuff pretty consistently, which is nice. But those 50% off sales are essentially equaling the value of what I may have just picked up a, you know, hard copy for three, four months before that sale. So, you know, I, I can see just, you know, to your point, I can definitely see the value in both of them. Me, I am obviously on the side of a physical game. And when you did bring up the idea of trading in a GameStop, I laughed because I've never traded in a video game in my life, hence the large collection. Yeah, it's uh, it's just one of those things everybody's kind of got to pick and choose which titles, like, like there are things that I think I would prefer to own and things that I would prefer to, 
just have digitally. Um, and it really just depends on your previous, you know, relationship with those games. Like some games just have enough nostalgia that like if you could pick up that retro copy, you know, in box, go for it if you can afford it. If it's a reasonable game and it means enough to you, it's like owning anything like if it doesn't have the physical sentimental value then it's just taking up space but if it's something that you just kind of want to mess around with for a little bit you know that also might be a good reason to pick it up physically because you can get more return on your money by trading it in somewhere so it's it's a really interesting discussion and we would like to hear more from you guys so if you want to make your way over to the facebook and uh, post some comments. You know, we'll leave a link to uh, some sort of poll and we'll get another discussion going and we'll see what all of you think about this. Yeah, man, that definitely sounds good. Um, going into the value of titles, as you were uh, mentioning, so our inflation deflation segment. Let's go ahead and get this thing started, man. Um, Voids was a game that Ryan picked this week. We're, we're hoping you guys in the future will pick the, ti the titles for us and we can you know, jump in and play in those games ourselves um, via the collection or, you know, digital download, whatever it may be. But I was tasked with playing Voice on the mobile edition. Uh, Ryan already owned a copy on the Switch. So I'll let Ryan kind of go into a deeper detail on the Switch end first, uh, and then I will give my opinion on mobile, and there is a reason behind that. So Voice is a uh, rhythm-style game for mobile platforms and then later released for switch it's a um anybody that's ever played uh any of the oh like rhythm heroes or uh guitar hero or any of those titles you've got the idea you know you've got the notes coming down you got to hit the correct line that they're coming in but voice kind of changes it up a little bit it's got um tracks that move and slide around it's got uh some different inputs hold inputs swipe inputs uh your standard tap inputs uh it's got lots of uh colorful uh beautiful backgrounds and uh interface that you uh, really gives you something interesting to look at while you're playing the game the music is generally uh instrumental or more like uh j-pop kind of style of music it definitely has that anime aesthetic it has a very basic story that is mostly just some slides written in the form of like letters or notes and you unlock more of those story beats by completing songs and getting certain ranks on certain amount of songs as you progress. Uh, now, the big reason I wanted to challenge John to this is because I had recently started playing Voice again on my Switch. It was one of the first titles I picked up on the Switch because I used to love playing it so much on my phone. But despite the size of a phone nowadays, it's still a little bit tight and it has an always on internet requirement and while you get it free you get a limited number of songs that you can unlock through play and since then it's gotten some updates as far as more song content and the ability to have a rotating list of songs that will be free for a certain amount of time uh, whereas in the switch version it is a 40 dollar release which is kind of expensive, I would say, for what it is. But if you're into that type of game, I'd say it's totally worth the price for the full list of songs. The Switch, you just pop the Joy-Cons off. Fits perfectly in your hand. You've got plenty of real estate to see everything going on and be able to interact without having to stretch too far. It's, I would say it's the perfect marriage between trying to play it on a phone and trying to play it on something that I would say is probably too big, like an iPad. Yeah, so I actually, playing it on the phone, I, I really didn't enjoy myself too much. I was finding it that my phone was too large to play that title. Um, the game itself was definitely interesting. I liked the music. I liked the animation. I liked the rhythm style. Um, if it was five bucks and I had all of the, the songs 
already downloaded. I think that would have been better. I downloaded a free copy, didn't want to invest too much money into it. Um, and it really just at first just starts you off with one song. And so I'm sitting there playing out one song and completely demolished it uh, within the, the various levels. I think I got up to, I started on hard actually, uh, just because it was way too easy on the easy mode. And um, got through back at a pretty good ranking, had like a 200 note streak going on right off the bat. And um, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see the appeal to it. The only issue is that once I beat that song, there was literally no other song to play unless I downloaded and purchased more songs. So the next day I hopped on, there was another song available. So it looked like on a day-to-day -day basis, they gave you a new song. But if you're sitting there wanting to get hooked on a title, I mean, at least if you're going to give somebody a free download and have the ability to purchase more songs, I think there needs to be at least five songs on there to, uh, to really get the feeling of, this is a game, this is a gameplay, like having just one song just was not enough for me. I did go into that second song, as I stated, played that, and then it just kind of seemed like the same thing over and over for me. It didn't have a lot of uh, differentiation from the previous title uh, that I was playing, and for me, that just kind of killed it. I did play it for a few days, and it, it just, it wasn't, as a free game, it wasn't a value for me. Now, I will compare it to another title rhythm based type of game that I've uh, played and that's Geometry Dash. And that's a free title on the phone that you can pick up as well. And this is one I'll actually play in uh, in flights uh, whenever I'm on a you know business trip or something. And main reason because I don't have to be connected to the internet at all times. It's you've downloaded it and then you're good and you can kind of progress through. So Geometry Dash is great because they have about three to four songs in the trial version that you can play to their extent, and it gives you a very good feeling of the different types of gameplay that you can get. Now, when you download it for, I think it was at the time, maybe two or three bucks when I purchased it on my phone, you have access to probably 20 songs at that point, immediately, right off the bat. And then there's other songs you can play later on via additional downloads or unlockables or anything of that nature. I'm not interested in doing that because generally on a flight, I'm only playing for an hour and a half at most, um, you know, this type of game. So and it's really just to kind of pick up and play just to kind of kill time. Something like Voice, I think you could truly benefit on the free side of things by offering more value to the free title aspect and then charging up from there. Uh, that's just my opinion on it. Gameplay wise, um, you know, as I said, it was a little repetitive for me. Um, the actual movement on the phone just didn't feel very comfortable in my mind. Uh, having to transition from holding down one and then hitting a few buttons with your left, you know, thumb, it, it just it seemed pretty complicated in a sense to try and keep up that beat. And while I did play a good bit and kind of got the hang of things, there were just moments where it's like this is impossible. There's no way to maintain a streak on here unless I have some rapid ability to press a hundred times at once, like. I, I don't know, man, just overall for me, it wasn't, it, it was what I expected at first, but after a while it was like, I'm, I'm kind of done. Yeah. See, and that's, uh, that's kind of the thing is having bought the switch version like a year ago and not having really played the mobile version since I, I went back and I got it too. And I was amazed to find that it was actually a lot different than I remember it being. I remember there being a good selection of free songs. I don't remember there being as much of a rotation, and I don't remember at all there being a section where you can watch a like two-minute ad to play a song either. So it's it definitely seems like they've changed, and not in the best way. It seems like probably you would have had a better free-to-play experience before the full version had been released. So it, it was kind of uh, an interesting way to go back and a different take, because as opposed to doing a, a game that came out a long time ago and saying, you know, is this worth it to a collector? Is it worth it for what it costs now versus how much it originally came out for? We were evaluating a paid version of a game versus a free version of the game. And it sounds like, I got more value out of the $40 version than you got out of the free version, which is kind of backwards to what you would expect. Yeah, definitely, man. I In that free version that I played, 
I would also I would obviously just off of that recommend don't download it. It's not worth the time just because you don't have a lot of flexibility in what you're doing in that title. I mean, it's right off the bat, just all right, here's one song to kind of give you the flavor of the game. All right, now you gotta pay for everything else. Like that to me is not a good way to have a game set up on a mobile platform. Uh, Mario Run would be a pretty good example of how you should be doing it. You got 10 levels that are automatically unlocked in Mario Run. And then right off the bat, they're like, all right, we hope you enjoyed the 10 levels. If you want to spend, I think it's 10 or $15 to purchase the full version, you can go ahead and do that now. That to me made more sense. Now, I didn't buy the full version because it wasn't, in my mind, worth 10 to 15 bucks for a kind of pick up and play every now and then. Uh, but you at least, that, that's the way that it should be done. Like, here's a very good sample size of what you can expect to play versus put a dollar in or two bucks in every time you want to get a new song and not knowing what that song is. That just doesn't seem like a good way to run a run a title on, on a mobile platform. I definitely think that, you know, I wouldn't have paid $40, I can tell you that, but if I were to see Voice sitting on the Switch for, you know, five, ten bucks, I'd probably pick it up just to, to have another title that I can play every now and then. Yeah, and I would definitely agree. I think that I probably overpaid for this game. Um, I mean, I had invested a little bit of time and money into the original mobile version that I had played. So, uh, you know, that actually made the price go up a little bit higher for me. Um, but I enjoyed it. So I, I thought that it was worth it for me, but I definitely, it would be hard for me to try to go to somebody else and say, hey, this is a $40 game. It's totally deserving of your money, especially if they're not as into the free to pay version. So, I mean, at least that's kind of one thing. It doesn't have a good demo, but it does have a demo and it is on a different platform. But, you know, it's something that you can recommend to anybody to check out. And if they don't like it on that version or they do like it on that version, then they know moving forward whether they should look into investing into a larger version of it for another platform. And I think that that type of model is at least interesting, especially because a lot of games are being ported to Switch, Steam games and mobile games alike. It's kind of interesting to be able to look at these and say, hey, you could pick it up and try it on something else for free. And if you do like that, guess what? Switch has a good version of that that you can pick up for an additional value. Albeit not really worth $40 uh, in my thought. Um, and actually, I was just looking it up. So a physical copy of a game right now is running for 35 bucks used at GameStop and $40 brand new. So anybody out there that's interested in the game, I would recommend watching some videos. Play a free demo on iOS. If there is a Switch demo, play that too. Do not spend $40 on this title unless you truly think it's going to be of that value. Um, and let's go ahead and, Ryan, I'd say uh, we've probably extended our time a little further than what we would usually do. So, Hey, what, it's an inaugural episode. we got to give the people what they want. That's true. It's kind of like those uh, season premieres. So I would say let's go ahead and close this out. Um, next week, guys, we're going to be discussing our next inflation and deflation title. Uh, I actually got Ryan to play some Rival Schools on PS1, a title he had never heard about, uh, oddly enough. And, uh, yeah, uh, what was your initial impression, just uh, as a little taste for next week? Just as a little taste, I thought that it was a wonderful-looking game. It was a very competent experience, and uh, I had a good time with it. But is it worth the value? Find out next week. Yeah. That is the case. We will find out next week. And uh, just a reminder, if there are any topics that you want to listen to, if you have a game that you want to throw our way uh, for the inflation and deflation segment, just let us know in the comments below, either in Facebook or YouTube. Yeah, and don't forget to leave your opinions on the arguments of uh, Nintendo Switch online service. Worth it or not worth it. And the same with uh, the physical versus digital ownership of games let us know on the facebook and please 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 when you are commenting just let ryan know how wrong he actually is please i need it i need to know i need to know that everything i think is wrong exactly well we thank you all for listening 
to the Game Deflators podcast, season two, episode one. This has been John and Ryan, and we are the Game Deflators. Have a good one, folks.